Okay, hello everybody. I haven't seen many of you for a long time, but it's a real pleasure to, to um, have you with us at this first webinar. This um, first slide is a very important one to me because it shows a part of a program in Western Ethiopia, which I consider one of the best we have. Or, uh, and these hedgerows, which you can see on the picture here on the slide, these were planted, some of these were planted 30 years ago. And the, the results overall, extraordinary. If you look at the satellite imagery, you'll find there's a tremendous amount of verba being used in this area. Erosion has been reduced and groundwater has improved dramatically. So why do we want to embed vetiver? Number one is to increase soil moisture. If we can get soil moisture increased substantially, the, a lot of other good things happen. We reduce soil loss because there's more moisture in the ground and less soil being taken away by, by runoff. We increase soil organic matter, improve soil health, and at the end of the day, increase net farm incomes. So we've got to get it right on the farm. Downstream of the farm, all species, including humans, will benefit from reduced sediment, reduced chemicals, cleaner and more, and more water. Just to remind some people what erosion looks like, uh, on this right hand up top, of, upper right, we've got um, erosion normally, rilling normally starts at about two meter vertical interval after when the water starts picking up a bit of speed. <clears throat> we get this rilling occurring and as, as it gets worse, the rills get bigger and we get this sort of situation. And in some parts of the world, uh, it is so bad that it becomes gullies. And this actually in Lesotho was engineered, constructed uh, contours which collapsed and broke and this erosion took place. It was very serious. In Africa, uh, this is uh, African farms which have been destroyed by erosion. Some of it caused by badly planned roads, uh, pumping their water out and uh, eroding the farms. Soil loss also and erosion concern uh, occurs on flatland. A lot of people said, oh, you don't need to do anything about flatland. Well, you do. This is in Zimbabwe here. The soil, very flat land, vertisols. Soil is eroded onto into the neighboring land and is deposited there, causing a lot of trouble. Here on flat land, you can see erosion taking place. Here again, the rills have become gullies, trees that appear to stop the erosion. And in the end, you get major flooding. We have two systems of uh, er erosion control. We have a hard system and we have uh, the conventional contour banks, normally graded, the water shifted into, into waterways. Uh, and uh, often these waterways become gullies. They're expensive to construct, expensive to maintain. They often fail. They take up space. They divert precious rainfall off crop fields and have really no add-on benefits at all. Here's a case in, uh, this was actually in Zimbabwe many years ago, where this system was put in and you've got that sort of erosion taking place. The soft system, biological system, as with vetiver grass, uh, here are uh, it, it's low maintenance, since construction costs are low, rarely exhibit failure, minimum space requirement, divert rainfall runoff, heal gullies, and have many add-on benefits. This photo here is rather important because it really shows how a bit of a hedge works. 
the runoff comes down this uh, uh, this slope, it hits the hedge, and it gets spread out. And you can see how evenly this uh, uh, trash, which has come off the field, has spread out behind the hedge. Here again, you get high velocity water coming down the hill slope, and the bed of a hedgerow spreads it out. Now, there are six basic modes of applying vetiver on a farm. In the past, many farmers have been only told about one, which is for erosion control. And I think if many if farmers knew about the others, they would be more uh, interested in using the technology. We can use it for a whole protection of the whole farm. We can also use it for inserting uh, hedges on a sort of ad hoc basis. We could use vetiver plants or uh, as uh, for various configurations to enhance crop performance based on specific vetiver characteristics. We can use it for bioengineering applications on the farm. We could use it for mitigating non-crop pollution on the farm. And we can use it for various business activities. <clears throat> so looking at it from total farm protection, what will vetiver do? It'll reduce rainfall losses, spread water runoff, increase soil moisture, improve infiltration at and between the hedgerows, groundwater recharge, reduce erosion by up to 90%, creates natural terraces, which means slope decreases, which means erosion decreases, provides a permanent key line for contour cultivation and crop management practices, and it can be used for rehabilitating degraded farmland. Under extreme rainfall events, which are more and more common nowadays, Vetiver performs significantly better than alternative technologies. And here you can see one of the reasons for that this is in a, in a hydraulic flume, and you can see how this uh, vetiver, sediment-laden vetiver, uh, sorry, water runoff is, is blocked by the bed of a hedge and is allowed to seep through. And at the same time, it's spread out. So this water, as it goes through the hedgerow, spreads across the area below the hedgerow and uh, infiltrates better. This is a few views of total farm protection on sloping lands. This was a, a sugar estate in, uh, in um, South Africa, to fully protected by vetiver. Here we've got a commercial farm in Ethiopia, protected by vetiver. These are small farms in Ethiopia, and here's a farm in Cuba. On flat lands, vetiver is just important. This is some of Paul Truong's work here in Australia on the Darling Downs. And you can see here, these vetiver hedges can go for, literally go for miles uh, because they're not moving water um, laterally sideways. The water gets, runoff gets uh, blocked by the hedgerow and then is allowed to seep through slowly. This is new work by Graham Dabbs in uh, Zimbabwe, where a uh, 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 program there for conserving uh, moisture and stopping erosion on these black cotton soils uh, is being started. For large scale farmers, it is possible to plant by machine, particularly in uh, countries where the labor costs are high. And this photo here also shows how vetiver can be lifted in a, a nursery. Okay, now the ad hoc insertions, in other words, coming into an existing farming system and putting in uh, um, vetiver hedges uh, is also very important is, and is actually what most people probably do. They have a farm, they've got a problem, so they want to find the answer and vetiver is one of those answers. And here are a few examples of this. This is on some sloping lands in Madagascar. And this actually, we should look at this diagram here first. You can see this is typical of many small farms in, in many countries, maybe one hectare farm or less. They're all higgledy-piggledy. 
and you can come in and put these hedgerows in. And that hedgerow there will protect this piece of land below it, and so on and so on. They're not dependent on each other. That's the beauty of Vedava. This is in Balawi. You can see how this, these hedges have just been inserted here, and the, they're having an impact in this area. Also, uh, another very important use of vetiver on, on uh, intervention in, on a farm is to put it to stabilize the drainage lines and prevent sediment moving into, into the drainage system. Uh, some uh, other ad hoc insertions here we have uh, uh, being used for uh, erosion control, moisture conservation, and drop and cut mulch. Yeah, this is in, in Vietnam with grapes. Uh, another one in, uh, in Vietnam where there are uh, serious problems of erosion. This is on coffee. You've got the hedgerows here being inserted. You've got them here, and it's also being used for mulch. In China, I remember years ago, we went down to um, off the Fujian coast, uh, uh, Pingtang Island, uh, where the strong winds, vetivas inserted here for um, wind control, uh, erosion control from wind. And in Indonesia, this uh, was on the poverty project in Indo Indonesia, where there were major issues with erosion and uh, soil fertility problems. And they inserted hedgerows and changed the lives of many people. Uh, in drier areas, uh, this photo was from Senegal, we got sand dunes coming in, dune invasion onto farms. Vetiver was planted along the bottom of the dune here and it, it did a remarkable job in stopping it, stopping the sand movement. Many farms have uh, degraded land and uh, particularly the bigger farms and vetiver can be inserted into that farm system to um, uh, prevent uh, or rehab very serious uh, um, uh, degraded situations. This was in Vanuatu, before and after. This was in, uh, in Hong Kong, before and after. And here in uh, South China, uh, before and after using vetiver. The critical thing here is that vetiver is pr providing, uh, holding back runoff, providing moisture, allowing other plants to grow. Now, Vetiver also can be inserted in various configurations to enhance crop performance on a specific, based on specific vetiver characteristics and farm needs. One is using it for mulch. And we're finding now that particularly with a more focus on, on creating uh, soil organic carbon, uh, more soil organic matter, more soil moisture, reducing soil temperatures, all necessary with climate change and hotter climates. <coughs> vetiver provides an excellent mulch and can result in these sort of uh, improvements. Uh, soil nut nutrient recycling. We've learned a lot over the past years about a vascular mycorrhiza and how that interacts with vetiver and uh, improves the recycling of nutrients, which Vetiva cannot normally get hold of by itself. It improves soil microflora and fauna, earthworms and so on. And some recent interesting work uh, coming up from farmers, not it hadn't done been researched very much, is the sort of symbiotic planting with, with uh, Vetiva with individual plants, where there's a significant improvement in uh, uh, plant growth. It provides a habitat for beneficial insects and fauna. Uh, it can be used for pest control, particularly stem borer rice and maize. Uh, it uh, removes toxic chemicals. Uh, a lot of the work done by Paul Truong and others have shown the impact of mycorrhiza uh, on, uh, in helping to remove the uh, toxic chemicals. And 90% of the of the toxic of the chemicals are stored in the heavy metals are stored in the roots. It's a barrier also to ex external toxic chemicals, movement of uh, 
chemicals from one farm to another, you put up a barrier and it'll prevent or reduce it significantly. So it's good for organic farming certification. And um, it enhances biodiversity and it can be used for forage. Here are some examples of this. This is in Vietnam where uh, vertebrae has actually been planted either right next to a tree or in the same hole. And this is uh, with and without vertebra. This is without. In Senegal, uh, vertebra was used uh, in association with bananas. And where it was used, the, the banana fruited two months earlier than the, uh, that without. It's probably due to moisture. And in uh, in Thailand, here's pick another view rather similar to this, where vetiver has been planted around a tamarind tree and uh, getting much better growth than, than without. It can also be used as ad hoc systems for improving mulch. And actually, these are small vegetable gardens in Vietnam where vetiver is planted right into the vegetable plot, sometimes even down that line there. And uh, they're getting very good uh, yields and very clean crops. There are very few pests on those crops. And the result is a lot of excellent soil organic matter being developed. There's uh, some more photos here, papaya. It seems that papaya responds very well to vetiver. We've seen that in Africa as well. Here is how closely vetiva and cabbages are being grown together. Uh, this was from Spain recently. Um, this was sent by one of our members in Spain, showing how the uh, vetiva, the great young grape uh, in the early in the season is responding well to vetiva here. Here it's being used in pepper for mulching and protection. Vetiver can also be used for as the initial driver of food forests. And uh, there's been some interesting examples in India on this farm called Vanya Farms on the Namada River. And uh, it, uh, it was planted as a sort of first layer uh, before they came in and, and planted uh, fruit trees and other, other plants. Vetiver can control some pests. Uh, early work done in South Africa by Johnny Vandenberg, uh, he worked on uh, controlling um, stem borer of uh, maize and sorghum using vetiver, and it had a very high kill rate. The interesting thing is that the vetiver not only attracts the, the moth of the stem borer, but then uh, uh, conveniently kills it by uh, uh, upsetting the digestive enzymes of the larvae. And uh, it did, I understood it, uh, same uh, the um, stem borer, uh, Chilo species of sugarcane, stem borer had the same effect there, but nowadays sugarcane, I believe, <coughs> is bred to withstand stem borer. Then the Chinese, uh, Professor Liu, started working on using vetiver to uh, control stemporal rice, and, and, and that has been uh, very effective as well. There's also a possibility that it, it may impact on fall armyworm, a real problem in some countries. Um, Vandenberg reckons it certainly attracts the uh, fall armyworm. Uh, but the fall army worm does not have a preference to vetiver over, over maize. Vetiver hosts a lot of useful insects like parasitic wasps, ladybirds and spiders. And uh, also vetiver deters uh, uh, nematodes and termites. So it's, 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 there's a lot more we need to find out about it, but it's, uh, it could be a very useful um, 
measure, crop protection measure for any size farm. Uh, we know that vetiver can be used for forage if it's managed properly. And by meaning management, it means cutting it fairly regularly. The nutritive value of the young grass is quite high and reasonable. As it gets older, it's probably useful as a maintenance ration, and that's about all. And <clears throat> another way of using it on the farms is to reduce pollutants moving off the farm fields downstream and uh, also helping to reduce sediment from the fields into, uh, uh, into the local uh, creeks and drains and whatever. This is a very important use of it and uh, we should be paying more attention to that. It can remove uh, toxic chemicals uh, if planted, inserted into, into farm systems. Uh, and this was work done by Paul Truong and his colleagues in Queensland showing how vetiver reduces the uh, uh, level of herbicides in uh, runoff, rainfall runoff. Okay, so that's about everything you can use for vetiver on the farm and uh, whether a farmer uses it for all those purposes or not, or whether he just uses it for one, uh, the beauty of the system is you can just insert it into what you already have. You don't have to change uh, the farming practices very much. Then the, another use on the farm is for general bioengineering applications um, uh, to support farm infrastructure and uh, generally enhance the uh, farm ecosystem. Here's some images here, quick ones. We've got stabilizing. This was the labor lines on a plantation, a sugar plantation in South Africa. Here it's being used to stabilize a dam wall. Here it's used to stabilize this farm road. Could be just as easily a country road. Here it's being used for uh, gully control. And here for link with uh, canals, rivers, and drainage lines. Uh, it can also be used for non, uh, mitigating non-crop pollution associated with farm or domestic activities on the farm. It can be used for uh, leaking septic systems. Uh, most, most septic systems leak. Um, it can be used for, <clears throat> this is a fairly simple one. Uh, here's a, a little uh, more complex one with uh, horizontal uh, water uh, treatment of gray water. It can be used here for uh, uh, stabilizing and cleaning up a uh, trash dump on a farm. This was before and after, yeah. Uh, treating uh, piggery waste on, uh, uh, in, in lagoons, uh, effluent lagoons for piggeries. This was in uh, China, I think. Uh, it's also being done in Vietnam. Uh, and here we have a situation where in Haiti, but small farmers were having trouble with their pit latrines. And this was a fairly simple pit latrine design, which was, has been quite effective. It not only stabilizes the wall of the pit, but it also um, uh, cleans up some of the uh, leachate coming from the bottom of the pit. And it provides some, uh, some privacy. And I think that is about all. I've tried to go through that as quickly as possible. Um, but you can see that there are lots of opportunities for vetiver to be used on a farm. And uh, uh, for small farmers, it might be just putting in a, a, a hedgerow around the boundary of the farm. Uh, it'll stay there forever. And um, it will give protection on the top and the bottom sides of the, or where it's running across the, uh, uh, the slope and uh, delineates his farm boundary. Uh, for bigger farms, uh, it can be used for many, many, many different uh, 
uses, as I've shown. And um, I, I think we've got to find a way of getting this information out to farmers uh, better than uh, we have in the past. Uh, going back to that original slide uh, I showed you of Ethiopia, I believe that is actually one of the best uh, and least cost programs I've ever seen with getting better uh, into farms. It, it was, uh, uh, it's been done very effectively and uh, it is now continues to expand on a farm to farm basis. It was first started off by an NGO. Anyway, well, thank you very much. I'll now pass you over to Jim, who's going to talk much more about the process of getting this, uh, these uh, applications of Vetiva onto a farm. Thank you. Jim? Good morning. Yes. There you are. I'm, I'm, I'm back. Okay. Good. Uh, just one clarification since I'm, I'm back. As, as I said early on, we're still new at the webinar business here, and this is our first. And I see that um, there is a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. So that would be the appropriate place to send uh, questions, not the, not the chat function. So when we move into the question and answer period, if you would please use that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen rather than the, rather than the chat. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and thank you, Dick. Let me share my screen and see if I can pull up the presentation. There we go. I think. <laughs> okay, good. So um, I'm going to try to be very brief here, if I possibly can, so we can get to the, the Q&A. But what I want to talk a little bit about is sort of the process of, uh, of dissemination and promotion of, uh, of vetiver grass. So the, the first question is getting the message out about vetiver. I mean, certainly our experience as the Vetiver Network has been that it's really the end users and communities that, that drive that. With uh, rare exceptions such as Thailand, where His Majesty the King took a strong leadership role and that allowed the uh, penetration of, of Vetiver throughout the country. Um, in pretty much all other countries, it has been driven by individuals and it's been driven by community interest and demand. And I think we need to recognize that that's the strength of Vetiver is that it's a bottom up rather than a top down uh, approach. So um, I think that has a lot of implications for how you get the, get the message out. It's a bit like sending an email. You can't send an email to the extension service saying you should promote Vetiver and expect it to happen. Um, you need to get out with the communities and target the end users, the people that have a problem, the people that need vetiver. And as Dick was pointing out, that messaging is should now be more about the vetiver system as a whole because it does have so many wide ranging applications on farm that uh, uh, who knows what's going to capture the interest of any individual farmer or any individual end user. Not everyone wants to put a hedgerow but I think the important thing is we want to put before them all of the different uses Vetiver has. And if we can get somebody to even plant one plant because they're curious about it, even if it's a, as an ornamental, that becomes their, their nursery, their micro nursery. And then it also becomes the uh, uh, sort of first step in their experimenting with it on their farm. Publications and pamphlets have always been very important, even though we're in a, a, a world of uh, digital and social media. There are many people that don't have access to it. And also just that sort of tangible pamphlet that you can have in your pocket where there's, uh, when you're out in your field and there is no 
cell phone coverage. There is no internet coverage is important, but social media has really been an extremely important element for the expansion of the technology. The last decade, the explosion of social media, we know a lot more about what's going on in the world because of social media. It's potential, however, for linking farmers. Uh, I don't think we've, we've really uh, begun to explore enough yet. The Vietnam Vetiver Network is probably not Vetiver Network, the um, Going Go's uh, uh, webpage is probably the best example we've got right now of farmers that are uh, having exchange with each other and putting out new ideas. Uh, training of trainers, obviously, um, assuming that Vetiver starts taking off. Uh, oh, sorry, didn't mean to jump ahead yet. Uh, will eventually be a question to, uh, uh, to deal with. But in the early days when you're getting started, it's, it's really training yourself and then passing that on and training other farmers. The, uh, um, this key mother nursery is extremely important. The, the message of Bediver without the means of actually trying it uh, will be a, a, a dead end. You really need to have some plants. So that is probably the first and most important thing that you want to do is get your hands on vetiver, make sure people can get their hands on vetiver, make sure they can start uh, uh, experimenting with it. The, uh, so that's then when the startup nurseries come in, that can either be a, a household or it could be a, a community nursery. I mean, that is your first central supply opportunity, even as small as it, as it might be. Uh, I have given away vetiver to probably 30 or 40 people over the years, and I, I don't have any more than 100 plants on my property, and I just go and split a, split a hedge and give people a, a handful. The, uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the use of networks, the WhatsApp style uh, social or apps, I think are quite powerful and will allow you to connect a, a, a community. So I said earlier, our experience with Vetiver is really starts off in, a, in any one country with just a, a handful, if not just one individual who is uh, uh, passionate about or interested in Vetiver who become the champions. They become the focal point and how you can use the social media and particularly things like WhatsApp to start not only connecting for the champions in the country, but also then to start connecting to farmers because there are oftentimes other farmer groups existing and on uh, um, in these social media applications that, that you can reach out to. NGOs can play a very important role here since they tend to have more of a, uh, um, an existing organization. So to facilitate access to financing, to link across communities, uh, to try to help you get to, uh, to a larger scale, um, that's uh, uh, important. When we say NGOs, we're talking about any civil society organization. So you look at some countries in Australia, for example, or around the world, there's a very large permaculture community. And whenever I meet someone who's a member of these online permaculture communities, they all tend to know who, what Vetiver is. They've heard about it before. It's known throughout that, that community. It's not a focus for them, but it's known throughout the, the community. And I think that, uh, that sort of speaks to the, the power of being able to tap into these pre-existing networks. And then, of course, there's the question of your local extension service. And it's extremely important to, to have a productive relationship with them, uh, try to make them aware, uh, get them to come to your farm, get them to go to other users' farms. I know some people get a bit frustrated that uh, um, they don't think the extension service does a very good job. Uh, that doesn't matter. I think the, the important thing is to try to have a, a productive relationship with them because who knows when lightning will strike. Maybe your local extension officer 
is not the sharpest tool in the box, but uh, they might happen to mention it to a supervisor or someone else. So uh, you want to open those doors and and keep them keep them open. So the the minimum support required, uh, you know, we we have these really outstanding examples of national platforms such as the Sustainable Land Use Forum in, in, in Ethiopia. And as you saw, Dick used a lot of examples from Ethiopia for that very reason, that that Sustainable Land Use Forum was able to provide the sort of support and linkages between institutions, policy makers, and communities, and, and, and end users. Uh, not every country has a, a, a national platform that it could use or, or one that's as engaged but they are possible to pull together. I think of the uh, uh, a group that came up in Southern Mexico in Oaxaca in the early 90s that to me was a wonderful example of how just interested people can connect across different stakeholder groups and institutions. And they started up a statewide uh, network in, uh, in Oaxaca that originally started was started by communities. The communities were concerned, they were upland communities because of soil erosion. Uh, they were, um, their agricultural productivity, their land was degrading. And these were indigenous communities and they realized that their cultural survival was intimately tied in with their ability to stay on the land and to make, keep the land productive. So they went looking for soil and moisture conservation approaches. They found vetiver. They started working with some local NGOs. It became clear very quickly that even though Oaxaca is very diverse climatically and uh, altitudinal gradients from the coast to uh, uh, probably eight, nine, 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters, that vetiver was a technology that could be used throughout. And that, that then could provide a linkage for communities to start sharing. And they then they brought in researchers and before you knew it, um, you had a, a, a multi-sectoral stakeholder network where everyone just did their own job. So farmers farmed and put vetiver in and uh, researchers researched and agricultural extension worked with research and began to move it around and organized workshops. And it all worked very well for a number of years until such time as it became so successful that it required a full-time coordinator because there were so many people involved and there was no way to find fun funds for a full-time coordinator. So there's a lot of vetiver in Oaxaca and the institutions, at least the uh, non-government institutions remember it and continue to use it. Government institutions have a shorter memory. Anyway, um, technical competency is a must. If you don't apply the, uh, the technology correctly, it doesn't work. And so therefore it's extremely important that anyone who is uh, promoting or demonstrating vetiver know what they're talking about. Uh, good to get universities, research institutions involved. They play roles that uh, uh, are important at convincing policymakers. And in terms of getting to supportive government policy to enable vetiver, uh, particularly in, in public procurement programs or in extension programs, sooner or later, they're going to want standards uh, specified for its integration. And that's where your involvement with the extension services and universities and researchers will eventually become very important. So just sort of briefly looking at uh, this sort of idea that this is a bottom up approach that starts at the field level with the farmer. As Dick's already pointed out, there's a lot of uses that you want to uh, make sure the, the farmer knows about beyond the soil and water conservation, it's, it's all of the other benefits that it can have. And it would really be good to uh, get a micro nursery set up. Uh, it could just be three or four plants in the corner of the, of the field that you can uh, uh, get additional planting material from. Obviously established hedgerows, you can take plants out of those. Then you move up to the farm level where there's uh, uh, lots of other um, applications that uh, 
can can be brought in where the the household's concerns about uh, what to do with the pig wastes and the smell of the the piggery or the uh, um, the fact that the you're worried about your your well that's in the in the side yard of, of the house because there's uh, um, wastes and garbage too close to that. There's there's so many opportunities that uh, uh, it's important to make sure that we don't just focus on the hedgerow in the in the farmer's field. Then as we move up to uh, to farmer groups, it's uh, we're looking at lead farmers demonstrations, uh, starting to do farmer to farmer training and having uh, a little more of a plan for propagation to make sure that you can meet all of the needs. We get up to the community and the, the village. We want to start talking to the community and village leaders and the community based organizations. We want to start making contact at that level with the uh, uh, government extension staff. And at that, that level, because there's more people engaged, we want to start looking at training of trainers, having a strategy for larger scale production, and also start perhaps promoting some of the business opportunities around vetiver, because if there's enough demand for the plant, that could be the first, uh, the first business opportunity. Uh, move up the scale to the municipality level, and, and now we're or district, and now we're, we're looking more at dissemination of technical guidelines, uh, the idea of micro hubs where you would have a uh, uh, well, micro hub is, is an individual who is interested and they're a sort of a lead farmer or a, or a champion of the technology. Again, um, make reference to what we see in, in Vietnam with Tho, Tho Ngo's uh, um, website. He's definitely uh, established himself as, as a micro hub. So it's, it's knowledge, it's networking, um, being able to put people in contact with each other to get planting material, outreach and promotion. And then as we sort of move up the scale to uh, uh, region, province and country, we're looking very much more at uh, trying to get involved with, uh, with policy and getting the attention of, of policy makers. And this is where social media can be extremely powerful for uh, uh, getting getting greater attention. Um, I just want to point out I have uh, on the social media, iNaturalist, this is something that uh, uh, the Vetiver Network, some of you may know that uh, in collaboration with the Ties, we came up with a Vetiver tracking app and had that for a couple of years. We tried to get people to use it it was a little bulky, a um, little difficult to use, and the uptake uh, amongst Vetiver users was, was not high. Uh, so recently, we've just switched over. We think iNaturalist, which is, has both an app, it's, it's easy to operate. It's a platform that, uh, that exists, that this is potentially an extremely powerful tool for promotion and dissemination. Because the first question that any individual has that's interested in trying vetiver is where can I get it and who can help me, who can tell me how to use it. So if we can start to have a uh, uh, better coverage and better idea with people uploading their sites and their uses of vetiver to iNaturalist, then it's just a question of getting onto, uh, onto the web and seeing where the closest application is and maybe making contact with that person, which you can do through the app as well. And uh, the, the URL is, is listed above on it. And you'll also see if you go there that we're currently having a competition with, uh, with awards to see who can, uh, who can put up the most uh, um, sites. So there's first, second, and third third prize. So I suggest you you go take a look. And uh, then the last thing is this question of uh, um, getting vetiver grass technology in under different climactic conditions. And uh, this is just basically a very short piece borrowing from some work done by uh, a gentleman in in Ethiopia. 
Ethiopia, Habtamu Webshit, who uh, uh, put together a very nice uh, proposal, a proposal presentation a number of years back based on the experience in Ethiopia. And uh, um, this, these are for what they were pointing out based on their work with, with farmers, successful work with expansion there was they found vetiver was useful down to 500 millimeters a year, which is about, I think, the same uh, uh, experience you find in, in most, most places. It obviously, down at, at that level of, of rainfall, uh, requires very, very close uh, management. The, uh, the Ethiopian experience was that there was a higher cost of propagation, um, or about a 70% increase, because they were using containerized seedlings under drier conditions. So their idea was, and they found it to be successful, that you're better off passing a live plant with a uh, developed root system to the field under these drier conditions, but also uh, have a closer spacing. So that is what raised the, the costs of propagation in the, uh, in the drier areas. Under wetter conditions, the, the bare, root, bare rooted slips uh, work very well and a little broader spacing. We say in general 10 to 15 centimeter spacing to get hedge closure. Um, I think based on, on your conditions, on how much moisture you've got, how much heat and uh, soil quality, you can go with that slightly uh, wider spacing. But I, I personally like the, the 10 centimeter spacing when, uh, when I plant. And then I just use my, my fist and put one on either side of that. Now, under drier conditions, I think this is maybe the, to me, the most important uh, uh, message is that your window of opportunity for planting is, is much narrower. Therefore, your organization and logistics have to be that much better. And this is why generally big top-down programs are going to fail because you've got to get all of your, they have a target and they have to get all their vetiver in in the 30 or 45 days when you've got good rainfall to get it established. And they can't, but then they continue to plant it anyway because they've got a target and it all dies. And then they say the technology is no good. But with an end user approach where it's the individual farmer or the individual farming household, they can get that into the ground at the right moment and you just have to make sure that they've got the planting material and they've got the knowledge. So the, the logistics and the organization are, are all there when you're taking an end use or an end user uh, approach. Obviously timing and organization is important in wetter conditions too, but it's much more forgiving. Um, and I think that is all I have to say on the subject. And we're going to now go over to, to question and answers. And I'm taking a quick look. Um, we've got one question so far. I see some of them have been okay. Actually under, so some of the questions have already been answered. Oh, okay, I see, not all of them. So, Dick, do you want to unmute your your microphone so we can get get into some of these these questions? I have unmuted. Okay. So um, since we don't have that many questions yet, I'm thinking that uh, um, Dick, you and you and I can can probably handle this without asking our our monitors to select select the yeah. questions. So, um, okay. So shall we start off with uh, our, our earliest questioner from, uh, from Graham Dabbs. Could somebody expand on the question of whether or not vetiver might have an effect on the fall armyworms and to what extent, if any? So um, I think we, are fortunate to have on some, some entomologists here. Dick, are you 
or where yeah, I can I can answer uh, what I know. <laughs> I'm told by uh, I asked this question to um, uh, Johnny Vandenberg, who uh, is a professor of entomology at the Northwest University of South Africa, who did the original work with stem borer of um, uh, maize. And he did some work in uh, Malawi. And the last information I got from him regarding fall army worm was that the fall army worm moth was attracted by vetiver but it would had no preference for vetiver over the maize crop. Whereas the um, uh, chylopotensis, which is the uh, patellus, which is the uh, stem borer moth of um, maize, has a real preference. So it goes and lays its eggs on, uh, on uh, Vetiver, and you get virtually a hundred percent kill. That doesn't happen with fall uh, fall army worm. On the other hand, what he did say was that the because vetiver is a host to many parasitic um, and beneficial uh, insects like uh, parasitic wasps, that these wasps go out and knock off a lot of the um, uh, fall army worm uh, eggs even when they're laid on maize. So that's the story. It's uh, there's a positive side to it, but it's not as good as uh, um, as with uh, stem borer. What I would suggest to Graham is that he, since he's in Zimbabwe, he should contact uh, Johnny Vandenberg in, uh, um, in South Africa and uh, have a chat with him, find out what's going on. Okay, then I'm going to ask uh, Paul Trong to take this this next question. Someone was asking about uh, uh, saline environment tolerance. How, how does vetiver do in salty environments, coastal areas, not marine? Paul, do you want to unmute your microphone and answer that question? Okay. There you go. I see. Could you say it again, please? Yes. How does vetiver do in salty environments, coastal, not marine? Coastal, if you have a uh, a tidal movement and part of the, um, the, the duration of the, um, the plant exposed to the salty. You have a sort of a, a low and, and high concentration, you know, when, when the tide come in and, and when the tide get out. And it, it can, it can uh, grow, you know, it, it can tolerate in that conditions, but it, it has very poor growth. Uh, if it's fully marine, and 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 and, and I don't think so, uh, it has to be on the sand, uh, the sand department, just off the uh, the high tide. Uh, but on the um, estuaries, when you have the high tide, the low tide, and the movement of the uh, salty water in and out and, and up to certain extent whatever can send that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think if you go onto our website as well, what you'll see is um, there's a whole section on the website that deals with uh, saline tolerance of the plants. A lot of it's from Paul's research and uh, you'll also see examples in Brazil, uh, for example, where there's uh, resorts along the beach, they've been using vetiver for years for stabilization of uh, um, 
a beach above the high tide line, as, as Paul points out. Okay. Yeah. Can I add? Yes, please do, Elise. Because of that saline tolerance, uh, we saw it a lot in southern Vietnam on anti-salinity dikes. So it is related to the sea area and, and the importance of keeping salty water out, and it reinforces the anti-salinity dikes, where it's not much directly exposed to salty water, but indirectly. Okay, thank you, Elise. Uh, let's see, so other questions? Dale, are there any, uh, maybe we should, we, we will. Uh, um. <laughs> I'm busy typing over some answers. Uh, okay, I see something here from Jane. Uh, yeah. we've, we have had a barrier to install vetiver on our infrastructure in Kenya. China is our major contractor but still turns down better application. And yet in China, it is widely used. What can we do to penetrate this sector? Okay, well, I think on the, on the one hand, the, uh, um, it's, you, you need to talk to both the, uh, uh, the ministry that's in charge of the, the contracting there in, uh, um, in Kenya since they're the ones that are putting out the technical standards that the contractors are, are bidding on, they need to drive it to a certain extent from, from that, that end. Um, but also from the contractor end, it's uh, if the, the contract requirements specify that you will do vegetative stabilization, then they're going to be obviously interested because they have to deliver on that for the for the contract. So that's why in the in the first instance, you really like to promote to your uh, your transport sector to use soft solutions on these things. But I think outreach to the to the contractors they're they're a business, and I think the best you can do is try to make them aware. Uh, but you're not going to have much leverage to twist twist their arm and uh, and, for, and force them to put in vetiver if the the uh, procurement uh, contract does not in, include those standards so uh, my view you want to focus a little bit first on on the government side of it than uh, um, than on the contractor side and I think one of the best arguments that I heard, for, for government was when we did a, uh, a workshop in El Salvador and we had someone from the Ministry of Transport presenting the work that they had done in integrating vetiver into the Ministry of, of Transports and, and Roads work. And when I asked them, what was your interest in vetiver? His response was, during the construction period, we have a very ample budget for uh, uh, for doing things, but during following construction, the operation and maintenance phase, we have no budget. And so to me, by making that upfront investment in, in vetiver, I get a longer life out of my infrastructure and out of my road. I have less problems with my, with my drainage. I have less problems with uh, er erosion. And the way he put it, is um, I don't mind losing a finger or two, but I don't want to lose the whole hand. So I thought that was an excellent selling point for a ministry of, of transport is that this will reduce your longer term operation and maintenance costs. And if you get it in uh, during the construction phase, you've got plenty of budget to do it. So um, I, I don't know if... Uh, Anyone else? Uh, Elise, I think you've also had uh, some experience with trying to convince contractors. You're on mute, Elise. Yeah, that was with Jane who asked the question. And we, yeah, yeah. We, we did work trying to convince roads authority, rural roads, highways. We did a demonstration 
And I did also the training in Kerala. So there is very fair India handbook on controlling erosion uh, related to roads. That you can refer to that section in the handbook as well. Yeah, the Kerala yeah. handbook on. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Jim. I think I like very much what you said, uh, Jim, that the invest in very fair in the construction phase is where you have to invest it and not delegate it to grassing maintenance kind of budgets afterwards and that this upfront investment pays itself back i think it's a very strong argument yeah Paul? can i add uh, i can um, sort of add on with our own experience here the it is too late once the construction started it has to be at the design stage and specify that the they had to use regular. In the case where I have a, a very good example working in uh, with the um, robot in uh, in uh, in New Guinea, but Papa New Guinea here, the he they ask him to put on a demonstration site a a. a a small section. He did it, it worked very well, but they said, unfortunately, it's not specified in the design. For us to use it, you have to convince the company before they start construction. When they started, they can't change it. Just like you said, you know, there's no money for maintenance for sponsors. So it is very difficult. You have to go back in, in, in Jane's case, you don't know which company that's going to, uh, to do the, uh, the construction. So you, if we knew who started, who would go, got the contract, because say, say a job to building you know, 100 kilometers may go to one company and the next 100 go to another one, for instance. And, and then in that case, you have to know what company we have to go in, you know, working with them right from the start. But when they start the construction, they cannot change. It's very, very difficult, yeah. Thank you, Paul. So Dick, I see you want to uh, answer Amalia's uh, question for her. Well, I'm not sure if I can actually. Uh... I started a little conversation with her. Uh, she said that uh, she planted this uh, vetiver -ver in Paraguay and it all died, And uh, but they watered it every day and so on. But, uh, you know, unless we know more about that, uh, what happened, it's difficult to make a, a given answer. I mean, one might, might assume that uh, they planted dead material, that's possibly the case, but uh, maybe she, you could, un she could unmute her microphone and we could find out directly from her. Yeah, Amalia, can you uh, do the raise hand function and then that way we can, we can find you and unmute your microphone and you can ask your question. I think on the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, something that says raise hand or wherever the toolbar is. Dale, is that your hand that's raised or is that Amalia's? No, that's my hand. Okay. I was just going to mention that uh, on the road construction that an even better solution or the best solution, obviously, is at the design phase. Uh, in the case of USAID funding road construction in Madagascar under Chris Juilliard, uh, it was uh, a combination of the project and the government, that is the donor, uh, getting involved at the planning stage and then insisting that the contractors who were bidding on the various segments had to go in and look up vetiver. At that point, you put the onus on the contractor and that's the best of all situations. And I think that probably China did something similar, but in that particular case, there was no question about uh, not using vetiver. And so uh, that doesn't happen very often unfortunately, but that is the best situation. Okay. 
Thank you, Dale. And uh, I guess Amalia is no longer, oh, there is Elise, has her hand up. Yeah, well, waiting for Amalia, but just adding that, that this is what the World Bank did in the Northern Vietnam the roads program, that all the proposals uh, from the contractors should include how they use Vetiver on slope protection and drains. Okay, thank you. So, ah, I found a find participant. Let me see if Amalia is still, still on. No, I think um, the last Amalia has, has left the building. Okay. Um, what is the last uh, question, Jim? The last question. This is well, from, from Columbia. Ah, from Tom well, Nizet. Hi, Tom. It was mentioned that vetiver can be used for fodder. Can you elaborate that a bit more? For which animals? How much cuttings per year? Thank you. So, uh, Tom, I'm going to turn this over to Dick in a minute, but uh, there is a, a good bit of information on the on the vetiver website uh, of what has uh, some numbers on uh, on protein, on digestibility, on uh, uh, silica, etc. Um, I would say that some of the the for the uses of vetiver in India were very much for fodder with uh, farmers planting them around the edge of their field as a field boundary crop. And the interest there was that in the semi-arid zones of India, the green pick from it lasted uh, much longer into the dry season. And also cutting it for, for fodder uh, stimulated further, further green growth. So uh, for purposes of fodder, you generally want to uh, be uh, cutting it for the, uh, um, the softer, younger growth on it and how many cuts you might get are really going to depend on your, your soils and your, and your climate. But the amount of uh, um, biomass that vetiver can produce in, in the course of a year under optimal conditions is quite stunning, more than 100 tons uh, per hectare uh, per year of biomass is, is possible. Uh, Dick, you wanna? And so uh, I, I haven't got much more to add, except that um, the, the animal which seems to like uh, vetiver more than any others is um, the horse. Horses are very fond of vetiver, but uh, we have seen that uh, most animals uh, will eat it. It's not really a... Uh, um, I would say it's not a, a, high, a high production fodder. Um, it's more of a, a maintenance ration. And uh, as the plant gets older, it becomes uh, uh, less digestible. And what I would do with the older vetiver would be, I would mix a bit of, uh, I would chop it up and add a bit of urea to it and some molasses and feed that in the dry season when there's nothing else to feed. But um, uh, small farmers uh, definitely use it for fodder, but it's, it's cut pretty young. Normally they uh, cut every um, maybe uh, four to six weeks and um, cut it off and feed uh, cash, uh, cut and carry, you know. But I think I do have heard that on uh, areas where Vetiver is uh, under irrigation for some reason or other. Maybe it's effluent from a, uh, a sewage system or something like that. Uh, you get a much better growth, of course, and uh, it can be fed direct then. Okay. I assume, can I add on to that? Uh, yes, please do, Paul. In terms of fodder, there are two types. If you cut it, is a hay or a green uh, feed, or you can graze it standing. You you grow the vetiver, and then probably within six six seven months or less than a year, you can let the animal go in and they graze it. They don't go straight away 
to eat the vegetable when standing. They will clean up the old rubbish, the, the, the other grasses, you know, in between the rows. They finish that first, but when they finish that, they get used to the vegetable and they go eat it. And they will eat it really, really, uh, you know, low. Um, in both Vietnam and in India, if you harvest it, green, I mean, it's young, I, I'm not sure, probably, like Dick said, less than six weeks, and then you can feed them. You can feed to any animal. In, in Vietnam, they even feed to pigs. Pigs love it. And of course, the um, in China, they call the, the uh, grass carp. They feed the, the, the carp, the fish with the young, the young uh, vegetable, but you have to chop it up. Uh, but once one, it's one, it's um, the old one that Dick, Dick mentioned that. Um, in terms of as a hay, if there's nothing else to eat, here in Australia, you know, under drought condition, there's nothing else to eat. They will eat the vetiver. And, 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 and we have a scheme here that we, we harvest the, the vetiver in, in our uh, sewage treatment plant. We bail it up and we send out to uh, drought, you know, a certain area and they will eat it. It's no problem at all. So it, it, it's not probably, Normally, it's not a preferred food for fodder, but if you prepare properly, and if you you know you know when they need it, where under conditions that they need to feed, they will eat it. So it's no problem. Thank you, Paul. So I see we've uh, we've got Amalia back with her hand up. Dale, uh, you also have your hand up right now. Is there something you want to add? No, just that, remember in uh, 2003, uh, we gave an award to a Kenya dairy farmer who fed uh, cut vetiver from hedges uh, as green vetiver to his several dairy cows on his farm exclusively. And we thought that that kind of independence and ability to adapt at the time was uh, really great. And he got an award from us for doing so. So I would also add that um, for example, in West Africa, vetiver is chopped to the ground and comes back by goats and sheep particularly, and that uh, there uh, it's not so much cattle and, and horses, but it indeed is the sheep and the goats that uh, take advantage of uh, vetiver very strongly. Okay. Well, we have Amalia now. Amalia, I'm going to unmute your mic. Um, I'm asking you to unmute and can ask us your question. Welcome, Amalia. We're not we're not hearing you, Amalia. It shows that your microphone is unmuted, but uh, we're not getting any sound. I think you've got a. You're going to have to set set up your your microphone in your computer system settings. It's Zoom is not finding your microphone. I'm, I'm gonna put you back on mute, Amalia, and give you a couple of minutes to see if you can figure out how to, uh, how to get your microphone to work. So Elise, oh, look, I... Oh, very... Very quickly, adding to what Dale said on using it for animals, the, there is a lot of misunderstanding in extension service that farmers don't like vitifer because the cows can't eat it, and that's very wrong. But what is missing often is to explain farmers that you have to cut it frequently every six weeks or three months to have good quality green grass. And that is really, a, the, and if that is not well explained, if you have uh, other like napier grass and under home farmers tend to yeah, use uh, grass that is too dry. And then there is other grasses that the animals prefer. Okay. Let's see. So we have some other questions here. 
Um, um, Jim, there's a question yep. from Columbia by William who asked about um, irrigation issues on uh, very arid environments or uh, very poor soils as to uh, what kind of irrigation should be used. Um, and the question ultimately is dependent upon the, obviously the scope of the planting as to how well you can afford that. But one of you may want to try and answer that question as well. Well, I, I can tell you about one experience, which was in El Salvador. And uh, uh, a company there was doing uh, fairly large scale plantings for uh, road and highway stabilization. And they came to the conclusion that they actually preferred uh, doing the roadside plantings during the dry season. In most of the zones that they were planting in, they could have done it in the wet season and got an establishment. Obviously in the drier areas, they would have had to do some supplemental irrigation. But what they found was that by establishing during the dry season, they didn't have to worry about weeding. Uh, so there were lower maintenance costs to the establishment. Now, the fact that they were doing roadsides allowed them basically to run a, a water bows or a truck and drive along and they would irrigate um, the uh, uh, once a week or, or once every few days early on, um, depending on the heat, the, uh, uh, the vetiver. And that worked extremely well for them. So as I say, it, it actually became their, their preferred method of establishment was to do it when it was dry rather than, than wet. Uh, anyone else want to add in? I mean, obviously how you go about getting water there and, and, and doing it, it's uh, going to depend on the, on, on the job. Hey, I've got the, uh, let me, Jim? Yep. <clears throat> I got an interesting uh, comment, or at least I think it is um, Graham Dabbs in uh, um, Zimbabwe's planting vetiver on this uh, black soil, which is very difficult uh, to work, and you have to get in, a, in there at the right time to do it. And um, he's, um, He's planting actually in the dry season and he's rigged up a water bowser and he runs that water bowser down thousands of meters of bed of a hedge every few days and um, keeps watering it like that. It's quite an effective way of doing it. it it's not cheap, of course, but it guarantees you get the uh, hedgerows growing and um, it also doesn't compete with the farmer's time because when it, the farmers on those black soils have to plant at a specific time and often that's the time when you want to plant your vetiver. So in this way they can plant in the dry season by irrigating it in, quite interesting. It's costing about $3 a meter, quite expensive, but yeah. it's guaranteed to work, I'm sure of that. Okay, so um, Amalia, we're gonna try you again, see if we, You've got your mic going. Her mic doesn't work. Uh, she's muted right now. Amalia, can you unmute? She wrote in the chat that, that her microphone doesn't seem to work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, Amalia. If you, if you send us an email to the info at vetiver.org, uh, we, can, we can have a side conversation through email and find out a little bit more about your, uh, your specific conditions and what might be some, uh, uh, some possible solutions. Uh, I see Samsam Nabi from India uh, has his hand up. So Samson, you wanna unmute your mic and... Uh... Uh, congratulations, uh, the Vetiver Network International body and the team uh, for putting up such a uh, wonderful program. And uh, I, uh, my question is that, uh, as I have put it the other way in my, and uh, Del Rachmala has rightly answered, uh, that is a tough question, he says, that uh, how can we set up a trend as to uh, how many countries are using Vetiver and uh, the types of vetiver applications that they are using. So can we uh, set up some sort of a, a application or a, a digital platform where some people can give an input there and uh, see how the work is progressing? 
Dick, I'm going to turn that question over to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, Samson, I'm not sure, frankly. The, um, <clears throat> the originally, uh, the reason we set up the tracking system was to precisely do that. And uh, we, the IVGT uh, yes. system, which uh, the ties put up, uh, had all that information in, and but nobody used it. Uh, there were problems with it. It, it. it needs to be modified. But I, I put in over 300 sites, which I knew of, and it, for each site I showed uh, what, um, uh, what was happening at the site and the application, why it was used and so on. Uh, one of the problems with the particular program software was that it 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 didn't uh, shoot the data out um, uh, summary data. Now, be, there's no reason why one shouldn't design a program which would do precisely what you want and uh, locate the vertebra, show where, it, where it's being used and how. But um, you have to have people to put the input, and if people aren't prepared to input normally because they don't have time, then uh, uh, it goes nowhere. And quite frankly, we have very little idea of how much, how many applications of vetiver exist around the world. We know there's a lot. I think we only see the tip of the iceberg, but um, it would like, we would like to see further down, uh, deeper down in the system. But uh, people have to supply that information. We can't go and get it. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, uh, we have got the we have got the eye naturalist. We're using eye naturalist now. I'm trying to encourage people to use that, and that's very easy to use. But um, so far, uh, not a lot of people have used that either. Okay, so we have uh, we scheduled this for an hour and a half, and we are now at an hour and a half. Um, I see that uh, Yorleni Cruz is, has joined us here from, from Costa Rica, and uh, uh, she made a comment about the, uh, the success that they've had in getting uh, vetiver into the public procurement process. So uh, perhaps I think as a, uh, a final, Dale, I, I think you, you managed to answer the question about uh, using vetiver as a fire break on uh, on farm? Yeah, just briefly. But there's also a question about pelletizing vetiver uh, for chicken feed. Is there an article mm -hmm. on, the, on our website that deals with the pelletizing vetiver for feed? No. Ram asked that. Yeah, no, there's on pelletizing chicken. for energy. Uh, fuel or biofuel, but uh, not, not for chicken feed that I'm aware of. But I think as Paul said, you really, you know, you want to chop it up and, uh, and possibly m mix it with some other things. It's good for, for bulk, um, unless you go for commercial scale. I'm going to uh, ask uh, your Lenny, what, would you raise your hand, your Lenny, and I'm going to unmute your, your mic, and maybe you could tell us very briefly about the experience you had in getting vetiver into the public procurement guidelines for roads and such in uh, uh, in Costa Rica. You still there, your Lenny? You let uh, Jim. Can I interrupt? Yep. Yeah, please do. She's actually sent, given quite a good uh, answer. She's uh, driving on, on the on the message ah. board. Okay. But um, I, I tell you, in the Philippines, uh, I heard recently in the Philippines that the PWD Public Works Department there, or the equivalent thereof have now included vetiver 
in the in in design uh, um, design standards, and it is being used a lot now on 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 roads, but it has to be used with um, uh, coir matting, and the reason for that is because all road contracts have to have coir matting because they're trying to support the coconut farmers and the coir producers. So uh, there's, uh, the demand is increasing, definitely in uh, things are changing in the Philippines in that regard. They recognize the value of Vetiver uh, in, in the highway system. And, and, and uh, there's one young man there who set up a company recently and he's selling, producing something like 4 million plants a year. And I'm selling those for, for to about 10 contractors. Mm. I guess on that question, all I all I would add is one of the more successful places that I saw in getting it into the procurement was when there were programs that were not operated by the Ministry of Transport, but they were sort of rural development programs. Uh, for example, in Central America and a number of countries during the 90s, they had what they called the social funds which targeted, uh, gave flexible funding to municipalities to have participatory planning processes and agree on uh, what the funds would be spent on. Communities tended to prefer roads, power, potable water systems. And so they ended up doing a lot of roads and they became the ones who developed the, uh, the manuals and the standards for road stabilization because they were dealing with secondary and tertiary roads that the Ministry of Transport generally doesn't, uh, they, they do operate, they do maintenance on the, on the main roads. So um, there's also probably scope for this with uh, secondary, tertiary, and more local roads. And in that case, you could go directly through the, uh, either the financer of that, if there's a government office, um, or directly through the, uh, the local government, because generally they might be interested in lower cost uh, road protection and stabilization. So um, I think on that note, we're, we're now six minutes over our, our scheduled time. Um, so I think we can, we can stop it here. I would like to thank all of you very much for coming on and participating and, and making the TVNI's first webinar a, uh, a success. And uh, we hope to see you in future webinars. There is another one that's scheduled. Uh, I'm going to let, let Dick give you information on the next one coming up. But uh, at this point, I, I just want to thank you all very much for participating and for some good questions. and and an interesting discussion. So take care. And Dick, you want to yeah. talk about the next one? Yes, the, the next um, webinar will be on May the 17th, same time, 1 p.m. GMT. And it will be focused on handicrafts, the use of vetiver grass for handicrafts and the process of setting up uh, uh, handicraft business, etc. Uh, we have some interesting panelists. Uh, you won't have to listen to me or Jim talking. Uh, they include Oswaldo Luque, who um, developed a very good handicraft, um, community handicraft industry in Venezuela. And he's been doing that for 20 years. Uh, it includes um, Jacob Jose from Kerala in India, who has set up a women's handicraft group for um, uh, for um, women who who have rather low incomes, and that has been very successful. Uh, there's a um, a short video on our. Uh, YouTube channel as a sort of preview of that. Um, then we have uh, Vonnie from um, 
uh, St. Vincent, who established a bit of a handicraft um, group in, in the local prison and has changed the lives of many men there who, who were inmates. Um, as you know, they've got this uh, volcano exploding in, uh, um, um, in St. Vincent at the moment. So I hope she's safe and I hope that uh, it quietens down and she'll be able to uh, participate. So that was three. Now, who were the other two? Um, hmm. Ah, the other one was uh, Paula uh, Pereira, who is the uh, um, director for bioengineering at DEFLO in Brazil. And she has uh, um, set up a, a community handicraft um, um, effort for uh, local women in her area. And uh, she ran a training course and um, that has been, uh, that was quite successful. She said, she's going to tell us about that. And the last person is Julie Slinger, who um, is from Granada in the Caribbean. And she recently um, ran a bit of a um, training, handicap, a bit of a handicraft training system. Um, June Slinger is a very interesting woman because her daughter, Vanessa, uh, worked um, in uh, Mexico, uh, it worked in the World Bank actually, and uh, she wrote a, an interesting uh, 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 paper about the use of vetiver grass in, in, in Mexico. So that'll be the, uh, for, for May the 17th. And in June, Paul Truong will be um, running a webinar on pollution use of vetiver grass for pollution control. And so we haven't set an exact date for that yet. And he's trying to get some folks together to get involved uh, as panelists. And the, um, the other thing is we would really be interested in some regional or country um, uh, webinars that we could host. Uh, just for example, uh, if um, uh, Jane Wagesa in Kenya uh, could get together um, some of her people there and uh, maybe involve uh, the guys in, in uh, Tanzania and uh, we could host that and run the, run the webinar, but um, the, the East Africans would, uh, would be the panelists and do the hard work of putting it together. So that's it. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for, for joining the webinar. Uh, one thing I would ask is, please let us know if you have any, uh, what the problems were of, of sort of linking into the webinar. I suspect that some people tried and couldn't get in. And uh, we try and give you some answers to that for uh, future occasions. And uh, you can, always contact me or Jim through a email address, which is very simple. It's just webinar at vetiver.org. Webinar at vetiver.org. And thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dick. And once again, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Paul, for coming in and, and helping with the, with the questions. Good to see everyone and and until the next webinar then. Take care. Hey, Jim, you must you must stop Thank the you.